I'm, I really don't like scalping because I feel like with scalping, it's just sometimes you can kind of get wicked out here and there and stuff. It really can be this simple and it's effective because it, it like a lot of the trade analysis plays out pretty pretty frequent. Keeping it simple works. But yeah, obviously like there was that situation with the payout, but then it's again, it was like my fault. I Welcome everyone back to the Alpha Capital YouTube channel. We're here for another podcast with one of the best funded traders that I know. And a very cool story before we get into it is that in the studio next door to this room, so just the same company, but next door, I got to interview this person for my podcast, Words of Wisdom. Um, I was still relatively small at the time, and it was my first 30,000 views, I believe, or maybe even 40,000 views, and it's the one and only, Omar Aga. What's going on, man? How you doing? I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. How are you? Good, good, man. I like the little intro, too, because it gives perspective. Like, you know, we were, we were, we were doing well back then. And two years later, we're still here, right? So we're doing even better. <laughs> yeah, even better. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I remember after that, I was saying, I was just saying that uh, after that interview, I got so ill. Mm. I got so, I, we were meant remember, to go get dinner. And I was yeah. like, I can't go. <laughs> I can't go. And then I just literally for a week and a half was just written off. But yeah, like you said, though, it's been, we were doing good then, doing good things, seeing progress in the trading, et cetera. Me progress, starting to progress with the, the podcast. And then we just kept working. And I think that's where we can start really, like in terms of, you know, during that time, what were the key steps you were doing? Yeah, man. So, um, cause uh, yeah, so for the audience that doesn't like, uh, doesn't know what we're talking about, I was on Riz's podcast uh, a couple of years ago. I think it's like tw end of 2022 going into 2023. And yeah, like that was when I was kind of like popping off as well when it came to props because props were relatively new, getting payouts consistently. Um, and yeah, man, like honestly, since then, nothing's really changed. Like my approach and my systems, obviously I've optimized them even further because I want to, I'm always trying to like tweak the system to make it more profitable, to make it the win rate a little bit better, to make the risk reward a little bit better, uh, different ways of trading it. But I've been pretty much doing the same exact things to be honest and just scaling the capital. The one thing I love about what you do, the, the beauty with this is that I get to speak to you quite often and yeah. see, we're not like sharing trades, but you're just basically like, oh, I'm taking this or I'm looking yeah. at this or this one I'm looking at for the week ahead normally in a jokey way you know yeah, yeah. um so it's cool because i get to have a lot more insight than i usually do going into a podcast but you know as you say about optimizing a lot of people always think like oh maybe his strategy is not good enough so he has to change it but the reality being there that your strategy has always been the same even in the last year and a yeah. year and a half when i say the same i mean the foundation of it and i don't think any of the tweaks you're making is like crazy it's always maybe just little nuances of yeah. like okay price is a bit more volatile now extend to this target rather than that one or whatever it may be. Right, yeah. But I've always found that your trading has, has been always very simple in the sense that it's not complex. It's not like it's crazy. And I love the squiggly lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The famous I'm known for, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, well, how, how can you speak to that in terms of like keeping trading simple, especially when you see, you know, as we have over the last two years, um, you know, just the, the amount of overcomplication on social media and people trying to be very mystical with their techniques when in reality, you know, very proven in your payouts, keeping it simple works. Yeah, and this is like a, a big topic that I've always talked about. And I, um, I actually tweeted this and like people got upset where I said like trading is not as difficult as people make it seem. And a lot of people are like, oh, I think, I think when someone's like coming up and they're struggling, they don't know what they don't know. It's very difficult for them to think that simplicity works because trading is seen from newer traders as something that's this difficult thing that has to be mastered. I mean, if you just talk to anyone who doesn't know anything about trading, they think, oh, do I have to get a degree in finance? Like, they don't understand the idea of technicals. So I think people automatically assume it has to have this co complexity to it. However, like, and I've shown time and time again, because like, that's, again, that's the reason why I have, like, public forums to just post to trade ideas. So it's like, yeah, payouts are one thing, but does this guy actually know what he's doing, right? Because you have people who just, they're able to get payouts, uh, just by like over leveraging or just based off how the model works. But like I showcase it on purpose to show like, hey guys, you know, it really can be this simple and it's effective because it like a lot of the trade analysis plays out pretty, pretty frequent. And talking about the, uh, the simplicity of it all, I've always just been of the type of person who I just can't deal with too many variables or too many different things going on all at once. I'm someone who's like pretty, I'm, I'm very simple. I'm very, I just have a different, viewpoint when it comes to a lot of different things and it's translating to trading if i was a trader who was watching all these different like indicators and different things that type of style would not work for me personally and i'm not saying it doesn't work because i've seen other people who are able to make something like that work for me 
I won't be able to make a decision. And I think that's the biggest difficulty with so many traders. They they don't know, if, okay, should I buy here? Should I sell there? But this is happening. But this is happening. But for me, it's like, listen, I know I'm going to buy at this area, uh, potential buys. And I know B, C, D, these are my ranges. And I'm going to TP here. I'm going to manage my trade accordingly. And it's all set. So for me, having it simple, it just allows traders, honestly, to not, not make too many decisions. Because when everything's set in stone, you're just... You're just executing. You're not thinking about what you need to do. It's already pre-planned. Would you say that helps you to reduce your emotions then because you're not caught off guard? You're not sort of shocked about what price is doing. And even if price doesn't go your way, you've already accepted the situation before it's even happened, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, 100%. It's, and I even tell like a lot of the students and even like people um, that ask me advice is when you have a pre-planned idea or trade, right, or pre-planned strategy, it's very simple because you're just following the rules. So now, instead, like versus a trader who's trading discretionary, right? That trader is going to think, okay, but I got to buy here, but what, what am I looking for? So it already adds a lot of stress. So I agree 100%. Like having something pre-planned strategy, even if it's like 20% discretionary, which is fine, but you have variables that's like, hey, if this, this, and this are not present, I don't take a trade, or these are what I need in order for the market to give me an opportunity, then... I think it's very, it just makes the decision making so much easier because I see the trade. I'm just like, all right, cool. And it's to the point where I, that's why I talk about optimizing because now it's like I'm looking for some, a setup in a specific time windows as well. So it's like I can just show up to the chart at like this uh, specific time. And if the setup is not there, I'll just come back for the next hourly candle or I'll come back for the next four hour candle, whatever the setup it is that I'm looking for. So I've optimized it to the point where like, I don't feel that many emotions. Of course, it doesn't, it doesn't feel good when you take a loss, but for me, especially with props now, it just, I feel like the game is just so much easier because it's, you're not trading your own capital. So the psychology is even less when you're trading on a prop account. What was that? Let's compare that psychology, you know, like, because before I remember our original pod was, without me realizing at the time, was quite early on into the prop journey for you, I think. When I say quite early, it wasn't like a month or two, but yeah. it was, you know, I would say maybe within the year. Around that sort of mark? Yeah, I, I don't really remember, to be honest. I think it was just over a year, I think, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. Maybe slightly more, but a, a, like not, not compared to now. Basically, been like three years, maybe four years of yeah, yeah. smashing the prop model out. Um, but like, what was that psychology like? So I remember we talked, and you originally obviously struggled with personal accounts, like everyone does. And there's a, a lot of it was in terms of like trading smaller capital. Um, <clears throat> sorry. The, uh, the greed involved, of course. And then I think you did a really good flip once. Yeah. And then they then transitioned to props, right? Yeah, yeah. What was that? When you compare the two, because there's people out there probably either still trying to do the personal route or there's people out there who uh, are just very new to the prop route. Like what would you be able to t talk on in terms of that difference between the psychology and the two? Yeah, well, so this is the thing, right? The psychology, the difficulty in terms of psychology for props is really the challenge. And I think the reason why it's difficult for some people is multiple things. But I'll talk about two. So number one, I feel like most people that are buying challenges, they probably don't have the money. They're buying a challenge that they, they're not okay with losing. So for example, let's just say I have a budget of like $2,000 for the month, right? I know that, hey, if I buy four 100K accounts, you know, or five, depending if there's discounts out or whatever, depending on the price point or whichever firm offers, I know that I have four to five accounts I can potentially have, which I budget for accordingly. So I know that it's just a statistic type of game. Like if I just pass even one of them, right? One payout uh, at two to 3% will pretty much make the money back. And then you just have one account, right? And then you could use that the money coming in to buy more challenges, right? Accordingly. So for me, I think as a lot of people, they don't have the necessarily the money to buy the challenges or they're just buying a challenge too high. So now it's affecting their psychology mm -hmm. because they're trading from the lens of like, well, I just paid this much money for a challenge. The pressure's on, right? And the second component is just a lot of traders I've spoken with and I get these comments all the time on YouTube, Instagram, DMs, Twitter DMs. There's like people are saying like, hey, I lost this much money trading, whether it's from challengers, whether it's from personal account. And like they just have no idea what they're doing. And to me, it's a little bit shocking because you would think people have, would have a little bit more common sense when it comes to that. But there's people that are literally just buying challenges, don't even really know how to trade. And then they're just kind of like messing up and they're just wasting money. So I think it's those two things, like where people are not necessarily having enough money for the challenges, which adds that psychological pressure. And also they don't have a strategy or system that they can follow, which makes it 10 times easier to make decisions. And it just helps the psychology a lot. Now going to the personal accounts, for me, 
I feel like the psychology is somewhat similar because the amount that I would put into like the same thing we were talking about for budgeting, right? If I that same two thousand dollars, if I had that budget, I would put it into a personal account and go for a flip because the way I personally view trading at the time and somewhat do to this day is I think it's so much easier for most people because of the emotional tools that you can have a very skilled trader that doesn't make money, right? But why is that? It's because they can possibly crush it for weeks and months. But then what happens is they get into a situation where they go into some sort of spiral, right? Like maybe life, something happened in their life. Uh, maybe the market is just a little bit more difficult. So I always understood that psychology component of it when I was coming up. So what I used to do is I'm like, all right, I'm going to put this money in an account that I, I, I'm, I'm okay with losing. And I'm going to go for like full margin flips. And you see a lot of people doing this. And the reason why I think it's pretty effective, um, and honestly, if the prop model wasn't around, I would probably like go back to that if I'm being honest. And some people might say strike record, blah, blah, blah. Like I'm just, listen, at the end of the day, I'm trying to make money. I'm not trying to run a fund, right? Like if I run a fund, I would, yeah. But nonetheless, I just feel that like, that approach is so much better because you're able to optimize and really make a lot of money during those moments when the market is hot, when you're on point. And then what happens is because you put down an amount that you're, you're okay with losing, the psychology isn't as difficult. So that's, so I, I think the psychology is very, very similar. Be, unless someone, now if someone puts like a, like let's just say a, lot, a large amount of money into a personal account, I think that would affect the psychology a little bit more. Uh, just because again, like if you lose $1,000 on, a, on, a, on your funded account, you're not really losing a thousand bucks. But you lose that same thousand dollars on your personal now it gets a uh, now it's like you are actually losing a thousand dollars of your own money that you worked for. It is always interesting because obviously there's the benefit, there's the benefit of the prop model, and but then there's the negative in terms of people not training their psychology and then treating it too much like a game, if you will, treating it too much like oh, okay, it's simulated funds, no problem, I just take take this loss, and they don't then respect the art of trading or respect the capital that they're trading with. Yeah. Um, but one thing to definitely highlight, I think. You know, off the back of what you were saying is in terms of one, obviously, well, both the things you said are actually very important. I think that the two main components that people miss in the prop space, for sure, in terms of having savings. And that's like the number one thing that everyone always says. I remember when I was coming in, at least, I don't know if it's as spoken about as much now. I know we've always highlighted it very much in terms of like buy what you can afford to lose, trade with what you can afford to lose. Um, it's There's a reason why people say it because it's true. Because <laughs> obviously the emotions are, I wouldn't say they're completely diminished, you're still an emotional person. You're still human. Yeah. Um, but in comparison to when you can't afford to lose that money, obviously the emotions are going to be more heightened. And then secondly, as you said, having an edge, you know, and it's shocking. Like you said, like it's so shocking the amount of people who try and trade, whether it's prop firms or not, but especially with prop firms, without an edge. Because with the difference with prop firms and personal, obviously, is that prop firms, you have this challenge. It tells you that you need to make this much. Obviously, now there's no time limit, so it kind of changes slightly. But let's go original, you know, original prop model was you had a time limit. So back then you had this time limit and this target you had to reach and making sure you don't lose X amount so you don't breach it. But people with no edge would still do that, yeah. you know? And then that's just crazy. Well, in reality, as long as you have an edge and as long as you have the finances to buy your challenges, you're good. Because as you said about in terms of the statistics of buying a challenge, say if I buy this many and I lose this many, but I win this many, don't mistake that people at home in terms of for yourself that you're not just one of those people who's buying like 10 challenges yeah. past one making a payout because i know um you're very consistent with your your challenges and your uh funded accounts you're not just losing them all the time yeah, yeah you lose them here and there but it's not a case where you're having like a, a big turnover rate yeah. you know yeah. um and that's something very important to highlight because a lot of people might assume that but in reality you're just you're comfortable in knowing yeah. that hey if i lose a funded I know that I'll do these challenges. I'll pass it again and get back. Um, and do you think that confidence, though, to be able to do that comes from the fact that you have an edge? Yeah. Um, well, so, so, so confidence is very interesting, right? Because I think it is that, but I also think naturally, depending on the type of person, some people are just more confident than others. But I will say this. Without a doubt, if you are super confident in your system or strategy, I just feel like, because if you know what you're looking for, and it's not, again, it's not discretionary, and it's very mechanical, what happens is you are the confidence just goes skyrocketing because I know all I got to do is wait for this one setup. You know what? I'm in drawdown. I've been doing a lot of dumb stuff. You know what? Let me take a step back. Let me go back to my A-plus setups that I know are already outlined, are super mechanical. And now I'm just going to wait for those plays to come about. I'm going to wait for the opportune time, and I'm just going to strike during that moment. So, yeah, that for me, it gives me a lot of confidence knowing that because, again, I've been trained the same strategies, and I've optimized it so well to the point now where a lot of the trades I take are on autopilot, where I've even, uh, you know the guys from Two Degrees? 
Yeah, like they help, they help me code like one of my top performing strategies. So now I even have the data behind it. So I know that it works a very, very like, it has a very, very high strike rate. I'm not going to say the percentage because I know people won't believe it, but it has a very high strike rate. And because of that, like I know I'm confident in myself. Like, listen, I just got to wait for this trade to happen. And you know what? If I'm in a, if I'm doing stupid stuff, I can, I know I can always revert back to that system or the, the strategies that I have. And that is going to help me tremendously in my confidence because I know, like, listen, this has a statistical edge. It's not like people talk about statistical edges all the time, but they don't have the data. Now, like, thanks to the guys from Two Degrees who really helped me uh, code that indicator, like, I know the data behind my system. So that gives me extre extre like extremely amount of confidence when it comes to performing. So, yeah, I think it's – I'm, I'm naturally confident, but that definitely helped boost it a lot knowing that, hey, listen, this system definitely works. There's no – ifs, ands, or buts about it. It definitely works. Um, and also, like, you know, the previous payouts I've had, I've been very consistent for the past two years when it comes to props. Um, like, I just know myself. So I know I can always, I don't lose confidence in myself when I'm going through a down spir downward spiral because I know, like, listen, I've done this before. I revert back to the, all those prior times and it just keeps the confidence strong. Was there ever a moment in your trading journey where you did sort of lose confidence in yourself, you know, maybe back on the personal days or yeah, early yeah. prop days. Oh yeah, definitely. Like I remember when I lost, um, this was I think 2020 during the, the COVID times. I remember I talked about the story, like I flipped an account from like, I think it was like $9,000 to like just under like 40K. I think it was like 36,000. And this was just me like buying spy puts. So this was back in the options days. And I remember I gave all that money back and I was like destroyed inside. And I literally, I remember, I remember this day, like I remember I was looking at different schools to potentially apply to. I'm like, I don't know if I can keep doing this, you know, because what people don't understand, it's so much, it, I feel like it hurts way worse when you, when you build an account all the way up to that amount, right? And mind you, that was only in about a month and a half, right? And, and people who were around the, the, during that time, they know it was like super easy to short the market. You, were, <laughs> you would wake up, like just triple your money on those, uh, on the options that you buy. And it's so much worse when you go from like a, like a, a big flip and then you lose all the money that you've made versus had I just lost it right away. Mm -hmm. Because at, at the peak, it's like you think like, I just made it. I just have this big amount of money now. I can finally like trade properly. I don't have to. And mind you, because back then, props weren't readily available. So for me, I had an account that was just under 40K. I'm like, I can finally trade now with decent size and make decent money without over leveraging all the time. Um, and then, yeah, like that moment, that was the only time I really felt like the confidence was completely destroyed. But at the same time, back in 2020, my systems weren't as good as they are now, four years later. What would you say between then and now? What would you say if you had to point at one thing? It doesn't mean we know it's not ever one yeah. thing, but let's say if you had to point at one thing that really made the difference in your trading journey, what would it be? Um, I'll be honest. I think it was um, journaling. And I talk about this all the time. I'm a big, big proponent of journaling. Um, and not necessarily journaling in the sense of like only gathering stats, right? But also like if you learn something. So like for example, right? Like with IC ICT concepts, uh, which is what I personally trade. I So it's like let's say he, ICT or like someone I'm learning from tells me, hey, like, you know, a specific liquidity pool run or some sort of concept works well when these variables are there. I make sure every single day I journal and I see it over and over again. Like, okay, there's something there, right? And then that's when you optimize it. Like, okay, it works best on these days or it works best during these time windows or, okay, it works well, but doesn't work well when this other variable is there. That is what's the biggest, has been like the biggest thing in my opinion, because that builds the confidence. When you see it all the time, time and time again, the same thing that you're watching for and you're journaling every single day, even if I didn't trade that pair, right? I have like six pairs on my watch list. Even if I didn't trade it, I'm still going to make sure to journal it. I'm going to do the FX, re uh, not FX replay, the, the trading view replay thing and play it bar by bar. Like, okay, when did this candle form? All right, it took out this liquidity pool. Okay, what was, where did, where did it end up going? What time did the range stop? Like all these different variables I've done for years, for since 2020 up until, I mean, it's realistically since I joined the ICT mentorship in 2018. And I've done that like very, very religiously. I don't do it, to be fair, I don't do it as much nowadays, right? But it's because I feel like I've optimized it so much with my systems that it's like, I don't need to optimize it even further. Of course, I'm still going to always like, you know, just see like, okay, well, maybe I can get a little bit better here. But I feel like that all led to the point where I was like today. So essentially, if we break it down, obviously journaling itself, you know, and then doing the process of learning the data, not just sort of collecting it and then just that's it, but actually going in depth. 
But I would say if you really want to boil it down, as you said, it's like you're not doing it now, for example. Why is that though? It's because you've done the reps. Yeah. And when, you know, when you're first sort of building the, those reps in, you need to do that repetition over and over until you're getting used to it, until it becomes more second nature. Uh, and then once it is, then you don't have to do as many reps, for example. Exactly. Um, but no, I think that's a very key point. And a lot of people just don't do it. It's, when I boil it down, I always say, just do the work, <laughs> you know? And it's interesting how like, when people when you say that, people are like, oh, I'm doing work. But in reality, there's a difference, I think, between what you think is work and what actually is. Like what you think is, is when people are like watching a forecast, yeah. you know, that video forecast that you dropped in the Telegram or um, this person's webinar that's for free on there or whatever maybe like the very bare minimum is what they think the work is right and they, they I, I looked at the market at 10 p.m the daily candle close I saw it and that was it <laughs> yeah yeah versus okay what does that mean what liquidity got taken what's the profile for tomorrow and so on and so forth right the deeper uh, sort of analysis that is necessary um, but tell us about sort of your experience over the last say 12 months in terms of we saw a lot of prop firms leave the US, right? And what was your mindset like when that was happening? Were you worried at all? Were you looking at futures at all? Like what was the process for you? Yeah, I was looking at futures to be honest. Uh, but like my thing was this, like if let's just say all uh, US, like if, if all US residents weren't able to trade with props, like I probably just would have went back to like personal capital and just traded with futures to be honest. But I still would have traded like the euro, the, the pound. Mm -hmm. But I just would have done on the futures platform just because like, for U.S. residents, for us, let's just say to put money into like Oanda, the leverage isn't the best. Um, so yeah, I was always thinking about that. The problem with the futures prop model, I just feel like it wouldn't be as beneficial because there's too many restrictions uh, for my personal style, right? Because uh, again, like for me, I can have one day that I do like really well. And obviously if there's some sort of like trailing drawdown on the specific day or whatever the case may be, it wouldn't cater to my style because I know I'm the type of trader, like when good opportunities arise, like I put on a little bit more size, right? Like other traders have talked about this. I know Umar Ashraf talks about it like religiously. When he sees a setup, he goes for it, right? Some people are like a little bit more static. So there's not there's no right or wrong answer. But yeah, for me, I personally would have probably just went like personal capital. Mm -hmm. And so what was it like when obviously Alpha came back to the US? Yeah. You're waiting. Uh, now you're trading with them. Uh, how have things been since obviously trading again with Alpha? But yeah, obviously like there was that situation with the payout. But then it's again, it was like my fault. Like I, It kind of sucks because like... I feel like when it comes to props, right? Like sometimes like there's rules because you don't go through the FAQ. And I was like, again, I was guilty of that this time around where I didn't see a specific rule. And yeah, I was like, damn, you know, but at least I still got the 25% of, of the account uh, of the profits that I was like, do. So I'll still have about that at the end of the day. But I mean, everything has been pretty smooth. I'm actually looking forward to like the, their, their own platform. Cause I don't like DX trade that much if mm -hmm. I'm being honest. Yeah. I've heard that a lot to be fair uh, in terms of DX trades. I think, I don't know. I don't know if they, it's just that they can't handle the amount of users. I don't know. I've never actually looked at it personally. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm looking forward to it as well. Alpha Trader. It's a good yeah. name as well. Yeah. I think so. I think it's a good name. Um, but yeah, no, it's, in terms of what you're saying there, I think it's important uh, to highlight as well. Like, because I think a lot of traders do that. You know, a lot of traders do that where they don't read FAQs. And I think yeah. over the last, how long? Maybe, maybe 12 months, probably more, eight months ish, nine months ish. But um, there's been a lot of changes in the prop space, you know, a lot more rules coming in, uh, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it can feel like a bad thing to the traders because they're not used to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it does mean that you have to then do some research to make sure, hey, this prop has this rules and, and the rules are slightly different across props. So it makes it a little bit difficult uh, to keep track. But I think it's important that you highlighted it there because, you know, we, at the end of the day, the last thing a trader wants is to lose out on payouts simply because they didn't read a rule or they accidentally forgot about a rule. Yeah. Um, and I think that it's also the responsibility of the prop firm though to make sure the rules are very clear too uh, and easily easy to find too. So, you know, definitely it's like a, there's a good relationship, I think, between traders and the firm itself, you know, and as long as there's a good synergy there, it works out for the best, yeah. you know? Yeah, and to, to elaborate like well, what Riz was talking about, because like the rule that I broke essentially was like the max lot rule size. And I completely have, I, I, it's funny because I saw it before on Twitter but that was before, like, you know, uh, Alpha was with the U.S. So I'm like, oh, I didn't think about too much. <laughs> and when I started trading, I broke one of the rules. Um, it was on NAS 100, right? Because the, the lot size, like, a, a, the, on the 100K counts, like, you can't go above, like, 40 lots. So I personally, because the way that NAS works, um, 40 lots isn't as much as, like, a 40 lot position on Euro, yeah. right? Um, but, yeah, and then I remember I went through the trade history, and it was the day before the payout, and I told you, I remember I told you, I was like, oh, man, I hope, <laughs> I hope like, it's a little bit different with Nas. But, but yeah, man, I mean, at the end of the day, like, 
I was upset, but I can't be upset at the firm at the end of the day, right? Because they were the ones, they already had the rule in place, you know? So but at least I got 25% of the payout. Um, it was a big payout too. That's the thing. I was like, that, that's what I heard the most. Cause like a twelve thousand dollar like on the return on the account. So it would have been like a nice like five figure payout. Mm -hmm. But you know, again, like I again it goes back to confidence. Like I'm not gonna cry about it. I know and I just got funded again with Alpha because the account got terminated. So I got funded again right away. Like and I have a bunch of other accounts kind of in phase two. So again, it's just confidence. I know it's I know for me that's not a one hit wonder. I know I'm gonna come back and I'll probably get that that five figure payout probably in the next few weeks, hopefully. No, I'm, I have no doubt about it. And, you know, it's interesting, though, because you didn't get any special treatment, even though you're an influencer. So. Yeah, yeah. That, that's <laughs> what, yeah, it's funny because, like, on Twitter, everyone always says, like, oh, you have, like, influencer privilege. It's like, well, I wish it worked this time around, right? Call it, they call it Dana White privilege. When <laughs> yeah. Alex, Alex privilege or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll have to think of something, actually, yeah. But no, no privilege yeah. for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm yeah, sorry. I, I wish I had the privilege, right? I know. I, I got some extra money, but... But you know, saying that though, like as you said, you already got funded with one account. You already got some phase twos going again with Alpha as well. And this week was incredible as well. Like this week, we had some incredible volatility. Yeah. Obviously, a lot of news news releases in one single week. Uh, I remember doing my my forecast at the start of the week. I was like, yeah, a lot of news. I couldn't trade because I'm just traveling and everything. So I knew I wasn't going to trade. But ever so often, I would open my charts. And then at one point, it would be down there. Yeah. The next, and then I checked just yesterday. I think it was, <laughs> it was all the way up here. I was like, God damn. Yeah, yeah. that was a week and a half. Um, like, what is it like for you in terms of like when you have those weeks, especially I know you trade EU quite often. Yeah. Um, and EU just has one of those very stubborn patterns that I've noticed over years. Uh, it's just that they'll, it'll go through a long period of time. And I say long, but like, let's say it might do two to three weeks, but it's yeah. really choppy. It's giving good trades still in terms of like a nice high, a nice low that you keep targeting and trading between, but not really too much new movement. And then there'll be just like one week or a couple of weeks yeah. of just come some volatility. Now, how do you sort of, navigate that or, or prepare for that is it something that you do something special when anticipating volatility or you just do the same thing so it's actually um it's actually pretty interesting because since like we last spoke i remember i used to be just like only eu and like primarily focused but now one thing i realized about myself is i trade so much better when i'm watching the daily charts the weekly charts and the four hour right those are like my bread and butter I'm, i really don't like scalping because i feel like with scalping it's just Sometimes you can kind of get wicked out here and there and stuff, like especially during choppy moments, right? When the market chops, it's very difficult to time a specific high or low. Um, but I feel like it's so much easier on the higher time frame, right? So for me, the way I manage that accordingly is like if I don't see anything on EU for the daily chart, the weekly chart, or the four hour, I'm I'm just watching. I have now six pairs that I'm watching, like six different things that I'm watching. So now it puts less pressure on me because now I can find a lot more trades because if, if it doesn't, it has to start off on the four hour for me. That's the minimum time frame I'll go. And then obviously I'll go on the lower time frame for entries, but the directional bias for me has to occur on the four hour daily and weekly. If there's no market range for me to trade in, then I personally am just not going to focus on that pair. So for EU, it's like, I, and I call, I remember like that was the, the trade I called in short as well. Like if the move is there on the daily time frame, right? Because that was a daily setup for me then I have good volatility that I can trade. So if there's this daily setup that forms, I know that there's that the potential for volatility is there, right? But again, sometimes, you know, you're never always going to know for sure if a pair is going to be volatile, but it's like, listen, if the higher time frame is showing me signals for a sell or a buy, I know that, okay, I have a higher chance of volatility hitting that specific pair, especially if there's news events during that week as well. I love that. I love that. Especially the highlighting the higher time frames there because I think, because I was a scalper for a long time. Yeah. I switched back to, to swing trading i always i say always but when i was profitable with the scalping it was more so because i didn't forget to check the higher time frame yeah but i feel like a lot of scalpers who struggle nine times out of ten is simply because they're just focused on the lower time frames and they just not all they have to do is click you know click <laughs> the four hour or the weekly look at it just dissect it a little bit take some information from there and then just go over clear a, a path you know um, and that's where I was, I was doing that mistake for a long time of just like literally just being on the one minute, five minute, does it work out? Yeah, it works out. But then consistency wise isn't quite there because then you just get caught out by that bigger move. Yeah. Uh, because the lower time frames, when that bigger move occurs might still look bearish, but all you have to do is look at the daily and it's saying to you, this is bullish overall. Um, which is normally what ends up happening, right? You go from taking that loss, then you go on the daily time frame. You're like, that's obvious. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was obvious. What's wrong with me? Um, but no, I think it's so important that you highlighted that. In terms of, you know, uh, the prop space and like, what are the common things that you see people making mistake? You know, in terms of the prop you know, challenges or being funded. Yeah, I think um, it's very it's very evident that again, like we were talking about before. I think like I'm not gonna repeat that point, but again, people are just 
purchasing accounts that they can't afford to lose. But outside of that, I think when it comes to actually trading, so let's just say someone is budgeting properly, someone has the proper system and strategy, but they're still like finding it the challenge difficult. I honestly think it's more so of, I feel like if you're someone who can't necessarily perform, it's just going to be difficult to trade in general, right? Because yes, people will say that there's specific rule sets that you have to achieve, but it's like the flip side is you get an account that you can make money from and you don't have to risk your own capital, like outside of the challenge fees. And to me, I feel like that trade-off is well, well worth it, right? And like, because so, again, I see people like talk about, oh yeah, personal versus, like, listen guys, at the end of the day, anyone could trade whatever. I've always been a fan of props, like no matter what, like I've always, since day one, right? And even like through like all the current times, like I'm still like fans of props because I understand if the model gives the trader who's talented an opportunity to make money without having to risk their own capital. So for me, I prefer that route. And the traders that are struggling are typically just not going to be able to perform even on a personal account. Like people tell me all the time, well, oh, you know, like uh, th this prop firm and, and like all these rules. I'm like, all right, so go ahead and trade your own money. Like, why are you guys complaining? Just trade your own money. But those same people, I guarantee you, if you saw like them put money into an account, they wouldn't be able to flip the account. They wouldn't be able to properly trade it because maybe the account is too small that they, and they don't have enough money, right? And I'm not like, again, everyone's financial situation is different. But at the end of the day, like there's an alternative route. You don't have to take that route. But most people that, in my opinion, that I think can't perform on the props, they probably also wouldn't really be able to perform with their own personal. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying like personal is not as like bad or anything like that, right? Or like one is better than the other. I'm not. But I just feel like the person who can't pass an evaluation, who's like the skilled trader, like realistically speaking, if they can't, if they can't really do that, then I feel like on personal, they wouldn't, they wouldn't perform well either. Yeah, because I know like people like to vilify, say, prop firms or just like the rules or whatever it may be. But at the end of the day, the thing with the the valuation firms is that you have the rules. Like yeah. the rules there, you know, yes, you might lose your challenge or your funded account, but it's still a rule set you have to like guidelines you have to trade within. Well, when you're on personal, there's no guidelines. It's just you. You know, and if you're not being able to be disciplined on this side, you're not going to be able to be disciplined on this side. That the emotion's going to be stronger as well because it's obviously your own capital, no matter how big or small it may be. Um, but we have talked about your system. We've talked about optimizing. You know, we talked about you know, having a setup that has a high strike rate, for example. Like, what are the key things that you look at when you come to the markets? Like, what are the things that you need to see? Otherwise, uh, you're not trading. Yeah, so it's like a very common uh, phrase a lot of like ICT students talk about, like, no raid, no trade, right? So for me, if I don't see a liquidity pool run on stops, I don't I don't take a trade because if people actually study like every single candle, every single session, every single big move that occurs in the marketplace, you'll notice that there's some sort of run on stops before the market goes higher or lower because the market has to accumulate or distribute sp specific positions before it makes a move. So for me, like that's the number one thing. If I don't see a run on stops, if I don't see an accumulation of like, because sometimes they'll run stops multiple times before the move higher. So if I don't see some sort of like accumulation on a buy or some sort of distribution on a sell, I personally will not trade because if you, again, and that's why like I showcase it because if you can identify when the market is accumulating positions and you understand it's accumulating positions at key higher time frame levels and you understand where the opposing liquidity pools are, you can have a full system right there that like you can literally print money all the time so for me there has to be some element of a liquidity pool run for me to like even think about taking a trade i love that i love that you know when i when people talk about liquidity though i would say one thing that they struggle with from what i've seen anyway over time is that they just start seeing liquidity everywhere you know they just <laughs> yeah. start every candle's liquidity every highs of liquidity every lows of liquidity every session high, every daily high, and so on. Like, is there anything specific in terms of liquidity that you look at or focus on? Yeah, so the number one thing is like price placement. So let's just say what happens, okay, so I'll give you the most common thing that a lot of people that make mistake with liquidity, right? As soon as price pierces a new high, people automatically think it's a sell. But no, the thing is this, right? So let's just, this is when you, this is what I was talking about variables. Because, all right, let's just say price pierces a new high on the, on the weekly time frame, right? That could just be, that retracement could just be a retracement before the market heads higher, right? Because the market's not gonna go up forever. However, when we incorporate, let's say, day of the week, so I'm gonna use like for people who trade higher time frame. So imagine you see a sweep of liquidity of a prior high, and then what happens is that that liquidity gets swept uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, right? Then you start to see on the lower time frame, so four hour time frame, you start to see that the market is taking out highs, rejecting. It takes out highs, rejecting. Now what happens is you're getting more information. Now you have more confluence. 
You have the daily above a premium level. You also are getting liquidity sweeps on the four hour, one hour time frame, right? So intra session, price is taking out prior day highs or the Asia session high or some sort of liquidity pool. And you're seeing that distribution take place. Now, another time, ele another element is time. So now on the weekly time frame, uh, on a weekly profile, if it's happening Thursday and Friday, now you know that there's a potential for a reversal because now you have the confluence at times there. So now everything that I talked about is all ref it's all essentially very different variables. And the big thing is too, if I'm playing a reversal with that certain scenario, I want to see where's the nearest discount level. Is there liquidity on the downside that's being engineered? Meaning, are lows being kept clean, right? So maybe the market is keeping prior day lows clean, Asia session lows clean. And beneath that liquidity pool, maybe there's an imbalance. That is one of my favorite all-time setups because now there's so much confluence. Like, okay, yes, this is a reversal, but it's giving me indication that the market wants to reverse at, at the very least for the next day or two, right? Because I'm an intraday trader. So I'm not trying, I don't, I don't need to anticipate that reversal to be the top forever, right? You just got to drop lower, give me a good move. And yeah, so for me, it's just adding variables to the liquidity. Don't just see a, the market take out a higher low and think, oh yeah, now it's time for me to buy or sell. Because you're going to like, you're, I've done that before too. Like you're going to lose a lot of money doing that. I feel like we just got the holy grail. Yeah, it, I, I mean, I'm telling you right now, that is we're the holy grail right yeah. there. Yeah. No, but like even yeah. the explanation was really good to be fair because it's, you kept it, as we talked about at the very beginning, very simple uh, in terms of, you know, there wasn't any fancy words that you made up to try and market it. You know, yeah. Like see nowadays, you know. Uh, but it was just, you know, I was able to follow that. I hope everyone at home was able to follow that as well uh, because very, very helpful. And I liked how you did the combination between both the technical standpoint with liquidity as a as the sort of foundation to then also the timing. Yeah. Which leads me on to my next question. You know, we hear a lot about timing. Timing seems to be the thing, I would say, over the last couple of months, um, that seems to be the big hype. Like the, the very big talking point yeah. of the timing, getting specific on your time windows. I've seen some people get try and get very, very specific in terms yeah. of literal time on the dot. Like, what is your observation of timing and how you use it? Yeah, timing is very important, right? But I think that people try to time it down to the minute. I think they're just wasting their time, to be honest. Like, can you can you find setups like that? Yes, but the problem is this. We all have, like, cognitive bias. So if you're looking for something at a specific time every single day, um, to the minute, right? To the minute, the problem is, like, you're going to find examples all the time because eventual there's going to be an eventuality, right? Versus, like, hey, during this pocket of, like, one-hour time window, right, which is something I use, right? Am I, am I going to find a setup within this one to two hours, right? I think when you have a little bit more broad, it gives you a lot more room to find, first of all, more trades and not to be so specific. The people who are looking for the exact minute, the problem is like you're going to keep doing that and what you're, what's going to happen is you're going to constantly take losses because you're not going to find the setup as consistent and sometimes the market just might, like let's say you're looking for a buy. The market might, might make a new low in the next 15 minutes and now you're worked out of the trade because you try to be so like specific because you know the algorithm and then the market goes in your favor. And I promise you, anyone who tells you they know how they can time it for the exact minute, just tell them like, okay, so then go ahead on a prop account, go ahead on a, on a broker, like a legit broker, and just showcase that you're able to do it every single time. And it's not going to be every single time, but do it consistently enough where like in a couple months time, you have like really big results, right? But I just don't think that's possible personally. Uh, maybe someone out there is doing it, but I don't believe it until I see it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to um, the way I use time, Every session is going to have a specific time where the market is going to have a lot more volatility um, outside of news events, right? So let's just say there's a, there's a day there's news events and stuff like that, and it can help guide you with it. But the reality is like every single session, every single, like so how, like going to the idea of a, a daily candle, right? There's an open, high, low, and close. During the exact, during every single session, there's also going to be an opening price, a high price, a low price, and a closing price. So if you understand the intra-session volatility, and you understand when, let's just say if I'm looking for buys in New York Open. If I know that the New York Open is possibly going to form the low between 8 to 9, and there's no, as long as there's no news event at 10, um, and these are Eastern time windows, then I know that I can just go to the marketplace. I can avoid 7 to 8. Yeah, will I miss setups if I do that consistently? Of course, we're always going to miss setups. But now I can focus during that one-hour time window, going into London close, like, hey, is my setup there? And for me, that's the biggest benefit of time. It's not necessarily that you can get super sniper entries, and of course you can with it. However, it just helps me focus in on like one to two hours for the day to get my entries, right? And then sometimes I hold it into the next day. Sometimes I hold it into like the evening time. Uh, so I think for me, that's where I use time, where I think it's very valuable because if you're someone who's trading every session because the market is open all the time and you don't know 
you're like you're training New York session from like maybe you think okay I'm gonna be there from 6 a.m. all the way until like 12 p.m. Bro, that's like six hours, you know. So I'd rather just focus on like you know one to two hours, get my entries. Once I get my entries, I usually just walk away, set alerts, and then just like you know let the trade play out. I'd say it's so helpful to hear that, just because I know a lot of people who make that mistake of trying to always find setups. Right? Yeah, and. Not only find them, sorry, but what you said is well, like missing them, like having this worry about missing selves. Like, how important is that to you in terms of your day to day life as well as a trader? Like, you know, you're a full time trader. People might think that you sit there and watch the markets all day. But the thing is, I know you love the markets. I know you love trading. And I know that you're someone who isn't not lazy, but like you're someone who likes to actively watch it too. Like, I've seen you be up and active in, in London, for example. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, but equally, you're doing that by choice, not because like you have this addiction to the markets. And what I'm trying to get to is like, how important is that for you to live a good life? Like the, the freedom life that people want as a trader where you still live and you still do the things that you want to do and not just be glued to the screen because of fear of missing out or fear of something happening or a trade going against you, whatever it may be. Yeah, I mean, it, it comes with experience because over the couple, think about it. How many times, uh, I want everyone to do this experiment. Do you remember the last trade you missed last month? Most people are probably not going to remember the trade that they missed out on, that they thought that was the trade, right? Like, oh my God, I missed it. Like, And then what happens is like, you forget about that trade, right? And that's over time. And I know like me saying this is not going to affect anyone at the end of the day. Like they might get a pers different perspective, but they have to experience it for themselves. Because if they're not going to, if they're not going to experience it themselves, they're not going to kind of change those habits. But over time, I just realized like, listen, I may have missed a euro like long on N NFP, whatever the case may be, but okay, there's going to be another one. How many times have I seen the same thing over the last six years? You know? So I feel like, and it comes back to, it always comes back to confidence because I know the system is going to present itself all the time. I just have to be patient enough to wait for one, right? And when it comes to like, you know, like be obsessing over the marketplace, for me personally, yeah, like I do love trading, but I don't, I don't allow it to consume me anymore. And I used to, right? I used to, like a couple years ago, I was really like trying to like just maximize every opportunity. But now it's like, and I think as, Especially with the, with the, with, with prop firms, I feel like now it's more it's it's a lot better when you're in a position where you just maximize one or two trades throughout the week. Where it's like you know what, instead of me taking let's just say oh let's just use an example like I take five trades like a trader A takes five trades for the week, but I'm more selective and I'm like you know what I'm gonna only take one to two trades, mm -hmm. right? Now I can put on more size theoretically because I'm not taking as much trades, but my quality is much better. And you're only gonna know if the quality is better if you know your system, right? So that's why, like, this is a big caveat because some people think, oh, well, I think this is a good setup, so I'm going to go, like, ham. But then they don't, they don't really know if the setup is really good or not because they might be a little bit inexperienced. So, so yeah, I just, I just, I think putting on a little bit more risk on specific setups is a lot better. Lance Brightstein from SMB Capital talks about this in great lengths on, on their YouTube channel. Uh, Umar Ashraf talks about this as well. Like, a lot of traders that I've, I like, watch and study who do, like, really big numbers, um, a lot of these guys also have the same viewpoint where it's like, listen, I'd rather like if I'm sitting there and I finally see an opportunity, it's like a really good opportunity uh, based on my strategies. It's like, why am I going to wait there and just take it with small size? Because I feel like when you take a bigger trade, yeah, of course, the loss is going to be much bigger. But it's like if I know I just hit this trade, now I know I can just, okay, I can chill out. You know, but the, the flip side, to be fair, is like if you do take that loss, you have to be patient for the next really good opportunity sitting there looking at the PL negative. But if you have multiple funded accounts, it's not difficult because it's like, all right, the next, like the way I use, the way I use funded accounts, is like I, I don't take the same trade on all of them. I take them all differently just because I want to diversify my risk. So I know, okay, this one's a negative, no problem. The next trade that I take on this other funded account, if this hits, you know, then I'm going to do well and I could possibly lock out a payout if it hits my objectives and my targets. If I really maximize that trade opportunity. It's fascinating because it just goes to show as well, like, everyone is different as a trader. Like, there is no one size fits all, but there are a lot of reoccurring themes, right? So like, as you say, the ones who really get the, the larger returns that people are after, they do share that sentiment of having a more dynamic risk on the right setups, right? Uh, and equally, when you talk about the, the prop model and how you sort of can approach that, splitting it apart, knowing that, okay, if I take a loss on this trade, it's not really too much of a problem because I have these other accounts here. And that's one of the pros of obviously the having these... Uh, you know, valuation accounts versus a personal account. Personal account, you can't step away. You know, yeah. it's just there and you have to handle it. Equally so though, like obviously on a personal account, you might increase risk, let's say for example, is just 3% rather than one. 
right? Just as an example. If it's a personal account though, the pro of that is that it's just 3%. It's not essentially 30% of your 10% allocation of loss, right? Yeah. Um, so you have a lot more room, so the stress is a bit less as well. So like, this is the pros and cons there, but it's always interesting to highlight. And it goes to show as well that like, we know some traders who absolutely kill it, who trade on a trade copier, so they trade across all yeah. of it. Um, well, obviously, I, I know loads of traders who like to split it as well, um, which is incredible. It's incredible. But I will say one thing. In terms of yourself, you're someone who has very consistently kept your education. Maybe not now. I don't know about it right now, but I remember very early on in your days, you were someone who was happy to educate themselves, right? And to spend on education if necessary, but put time into education too, you know? And I think that's very, very important because a lot of people, they're not willing to invest in themselves. And I'm not just talking trading, I mean, generally as well, like uh, whether they want to learn any skill set, a lot of people don't want to invest in themselves. But equally as well, most of all, because people do, there are a lot of people who do, do, but then they don't actually use it, which is what I was going to ask you is like, you know, one, why was it that you were willing to invest in yourself in this way? Right. But then two, why were you willing to do the work? Right. Were there any times that you did buy a course and you didn't actually watch it? You know, or have you always sort of anything you bought really gone through it and dissected it? Yeah, no, everything I bought, I always went through it. Like, I, and I remember the last part that we talked, I talked about, like, I, I went through Tom Dante's mentorship. I went through ICT's mentorship, Steve Morrow, WWA at the time as well. Like, and I have no, I have no problem giving people like who I learned from, like you know, props because again, they helped me become the trader that I am today. Uh, but yeah, man, it's just, it just mind blows me. Like it, it's kind of a little bit uh, mind blowing to me when someone tells me, oh, like everything's for free on YouTube. It's like, yeah, guys, it is. But how much stuff is there out there on YouTube? Like, don't you want to consolidate the process? I again, I know like people are gonna be like, oh, but he sells a course and stuff. Like, yeah, that's because I have all these years of experience. So I can make additional extra income. Like I don't, I don't hide from that fact. Like, and at the end of the day, I know the value that I provide. So when it comes to like education, I just, I just feel like it's so much easier when you have someone that can help you streamline the process. How many people are gonna say, "Oh, but YouTube, everything's for free." All right, so go learn from YouTube. Like no one's, no one's forcing you to do anything. But for me, I wanted that mentorship, right? So when I bought like something, I wanted to make sure that I was, I had some sort of level of access to the person or I get some sort of like, you know, uh, you know, guidance and mentorship because that's really what it comes down to. Like having the ability to ask someone questions, I can show someone, I can literally give someone my entire trade plan 100% for free. And I guarantee you, majority of people still won't be able to make money with it. Why? Because there's going to be some things that I'm able to see through experience that like someone can ask me questions. So I've always been a believer of that. Like even now, like there's certain things that, um, I'm doing like outside of trading that I'm like paying for certain things to learn because I want to learn a different, like it's a different skill set entirely from trading. Right. And I'm not wasting it. I'm not going to, I'm going to be watching YouTube videos obviously to see who, okay, you know what? I like this guy. Mm -hmm. Cause this guy is like, you know what? I, he, he resonates with me. He shows me proof that he's making money doing what he's saying he's doing. Right. Or whatever, whatever like niche it is. Right. It might, even outside the money, make, make money online niche. So, Use the free content. And if you really like vibe with someone and you're really like, you know what? I like the way that they trade. I like the way that they present themselves. You know what? I'll go ahead and invest in them. That's that's what I'm doing right now. So it's like funny that you brought that up. I literally was like getting ready to like pay for like a, uh, a mentorship and it was like a decent amount of money. But like I don't have any hesitancy because it's like, all right, I watched, all this, I watched every video that this guy posted in that niche. And I'm like, you know what? I need him to help me in this area because I'm trying to learn that skill set. So And I want the ability to be able to ask him questions versus like, just trying to figure it out on my own because can I figure it out on my own? Probably. I think I'm pretty smart, but I know I'm going to be even, I know I'm smart enough to realize I don't want to go through that, that trial period. So I'd rather just pay someone to help me during that. Now, obviously, you know, you have to vet who you're going to pay because that is a, a reality in today's world. But at the end of the day, it's like, listen, man, I'd rather pay for someone who's able to help me a lot faster and I can kind of like shorten the learning curve. I think it's so important because as you say, you can shorten the learning curve. Vetting people is the most important part there, like you said, because yeah. it is very easy to, unfortunately, if you rush and you just go, okay, I want to get mentorship, throw money at whatever. Yeah. Um, and some people do that, I think, but as long as you avoid that and you take your time, and I think you that's where YouTube does come in, as you say, like finding the person first normally will come from, say, YouTube, Instagram, like some sort of social media for free, yeah. as it should, you know, and, and that's why, you know, we put out value, you know, that's why you put out value, that's why these people put out value because they want to, showcase like hey i have the skill set hopefully they're showing their receipts you know and you can vet them accordingly and they allow you to vet them by 
giving you the 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 process and the receipts and the journey they've been on. Um, but from there, of course, you know, if you want to speed up that process, because I've not actually spoken to someone yet. Think about it. I've done all these interviews, right? I've done all these podcasts. I've not had someone sit there and go, I learned by myself. It's not happened yet. Yeah. Right. And it's not like I purposely, you know, trying to find uh, you know, people who've only bought courses. I mean, I, I I love unique stories, but to this day, no one's ever sat there and gone, I've learned by myself. You know, even from these professional guys I'm getting on yeah. to the to the just the us retail traders. No one said it yet for a reason because everyone goes through some form of educational mentorship. And let me just add to that point. Even like, okay, because let's say people don't want to believe me, right? And they just think, oh, yeah, he's just trying to show his course, right? Which you guys can check out, tradeandtrade.net. <laughs> but <laughs> that's old school. <laughs> yeah. But the reality is this like, at the end of the day, even like you said, look at the guys who are like professional trading firms like SMB. I always reference SMB Capital because I watch like almost all their videos whenever they post content, especially on like trading psychology and how to treat yourself as a professional trader. You don't see the traders on the desk. They have to pay to get there. Like, and because you have to buy their programs and there's other things as well. So like you have to pay to play at the end of the day, especially if you want to, like even you said, like the traders who've been there and now they're like in their 60s and 70s, even them saying like, yeah, I had to buy this. I had to learn from this person. I had to get mentorship. That's what people don't understand. Mentorship speeds up the process significantly. If you're someone who's willing to actually like, you know, submit to the time and just, you know, actually learn and then understand that there's a process to it, right? Like you're not going to just like ask one question and be like a profitable trader, or I'm not going to ask one question for this person that I'm paying for. And I'm going to have, I'm going to master that skill set. It's like, no, okay, I'm going to take his advice. I'm going to try to implement it. Okay. Something goes wrong. I have that person to ask again, you know, and then through that experience, through that time getting mentored, Along the journey, I'm going to hopefully achieve what I want. Yeah. How much have you had in terms of, I don't know if you've done a, a, a tally over recent months, but like in terms of like payouts from your prop career so far, how much have you done in payouts? So this year alone? I'd say the whole the whole career. Oh, yeah. It's like probably multiple six figures. Really? Yeah. What about this year alone? Though? This year I'm on pace. Right now it's around like 70K. But I'm on pace. Uh, hopefully, the, the remaining six months, because I took two months off of just trading entirely. Um, but like, I've had a really good June. Like, I posted on my YouTube thirty-seven thousand. Uh, this alpha payout was supposed to be good, but twenty-five hundred. But I have another payout with a firm coming out as well, a couple thousand bucks. So I'm I'm on pace right now to hopefully. I don't want to jinx myself, but I think I'm. I want to get to that one forty, one fifty. I feel like with that one forty, one fifty is like a solid place for me. Definitely. No, I love that and. Final one for you. Where's your your camera's here? Yeah. Do like a one minute, right? You can have a minute. You don't have to use the whole thing, but don't go over a minute. Yeah. We need it for a real. <laughs> but one minute, like your biggest advice, or from whatever whatever you think is going to help the traders progress, and what you would like to say to the traders out there. Let's go. Join the trading trading now. The thing is, I've had before you do it though. I've had traders on um, on my podcast yeah. who have been your student. You know, and yeah, you know, there's people like yourself, people like Kyle, there's people like Casper, there's people like Kimmel, people like Omar, you know, where people are reoccurring have come on the pod. Whether it's and it's not like they sit there and say, Oh my god, this guy was the god in trading and, and say yeah. it was more like I went there and it helped me a lot. Yeah. You know? And then they might have gone somewhere else and they helped them a lot even more. But I've had loads of people who've gone through yourself and the and the people I mentioned, for example. Yeah. Um and yeah, I think we're I'm I'm hoping that we're past a point in the ed, you know, in the trading space where you know, we know who the right people are and who the wrong people are. And as simple as that. Yeah, it's because at the end of the day, like what I put out there is like, it works. Like mm -hmm. I've gotten results. I have multiple people. You put out a lot for free as well. Yeah, that's what you I'm know, saying. Like on Twitter, a lot of people giving good feedback in terms, especially I remember someone, a tweet today I saw or, or yesterday, someone said something about the four hour. They were saying like, oh yeah, Omar, Omar, oh, yeah. four hour. And I was like, yeah, bro. Like that, that's the funny thing. Like I put all that stuff out for free, but again, the mentorship is like if someone wants personal access to myself at the end of the day, right? But again, I put it all out there. Like I think I think most people put it all out there, but the people that want that next tier is like, hey, it's available for you if not. I mean, if not, listen, I like yeah, YouTube is out there. Like all my free content. You know how many commentaries I've posted that people have like passed challenges, got funded, like got payouts just from like my weekly analysis that I put out for free on Telegram. How does that make you feel? I'm, I'm not gonna lie i'm not gonna be those people who are like i'm so proud like it's like indifferent <laughs> to me like i know i know it sounds bad but i listen man i'm always trying to be very honest because i feel like because this joe rogan put it perfectly right he said he doesn't want the neg he doesn't want the praise for people saying oh your podcast changed my life because he doesn't want the negative like oh your podcast ruined my life <laughs> and I, yeah so i don't want someone to like watch my strategy they blow their accounts like i, I watched him like 
Again, so I've always had, answer. yeah, I've always had that approach. Because listen, I'm not going to be always right on my commentaries, mm -hmm. even though it's pretty accurate. <laughs> But like the guy who blows their account, I don't want them to blame me. So when someone like passes an account, I'll use that for marketing, of course. But I'm not going to be like, oh, my God, like I'm so happy for this person. Because at the end of the day, you need to be self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. Give us your, give us your one. One thing for what? Just to help trade, whatever you think. You Well, one, your message to the traders. Think about it like this. I'll frame it like this. I want you to look down this camera and I want you to think of your best David Goggins, uh, you know, Denzel Washington, Eric Thomas, or motivational speech that's going to, you know, someone's going to listen to it and go, I'm ready to change my life. A lot of pressure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I put that too high. Uh, yeah. Uh, change the trade. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Stop depending on any specific trader, right? Like so many people, they'll, they'll buy signals, they'll wait for someone's commentary. The whole point of learning is to make sure that you're self-sufficient. So don't be the person who's so dependent on someone that they lose confidence in their own ability. If you don't have confidence, you're not going to be able to trade. So don't be the person who's waiting on this person to post a signal or waiting on this person to post their weekly commentary. Learn the skill set and be self-sufficient. Yeah. Well, Omar, it was a pleasure like, once again doing this podcast with you. And hopefully we'll do it again. Hopefully we'll get you at one of the alpha events. Oh, yeah, so definitely. Soon, soon future. Hopefully we'll host one here in the, in the States. But if not, obviously you're going to have to come over to the UK. Yeah. But everyone, the links for Omar will be in the description below. Drop a comment of your biggest takeaway from this episode. There'll be other episodes and other content from Alpha on screen right now. Hit subscribe. And until next time, take care.